Welcome to University Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Ben. We're glad that you're here. If you're here because your mom made you come or you owed her, we're glad that you're here. Uh, it's good to be with you as we open up God's Word, as we sing hymns of our hope and faith, as we connect deeper with each other in the mission God has built us for. We believe there's a purpose to this place. To these people. We believe that we're to build connections to Christ's community and compassion, both for ourselves and for others. That's what we're to be about. Uh, and so we do so in worship, we do so in service. Uh, we're glad that folks through live stream are able to connect with us when they're traveling uh, or maybe taking mom to a nice place this Sunday. The side of your bulletin, and this is your bulletin, you probably got one on your way in, uh, it tears off. Um, you can uh, drop that in the plate as it goes by here in a bit. Let us know how we can be praying for you. If there's a ministry or mission, uh, mission you're interested in, uh, or you just want to let us know about yourself if you're visiting and would like to uh, let us know that you're here, we'd love that. On the back, you can take notes. Um, it's an open book test later. So you can use these notes on the exams that you face through the week. Um, and inside you'll find many uh, highlights of things that are going on to let you know about the ways in which you can connect more deeply with who God is and what God's doing in this place. Uh, so we invite you to participate in ways that you feel called and comfortable as we worship together, as we receive from God together, and as we're sent from this place by God to the works that he's built us for. Uh, we're going to sing a, a great hymn of our faith. It's For the Beauty of the Earth. It's one of my favorite. Uh, and we're going to do all the verses. Will you stand now as we sing together?
good to be back with you. I was out last week. I think Pastor Holly it told you about that. Um, and I, I assume everything went well because she wasn't here when I got back. So <laughs> apparently it went all great. No, it's great to be back with you, to be in worship together, to get a chance to sing songs of our hope and open up scriptures that teach us uh, and fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit for the work that God's built us for. We do that together, though. So we invite you to find someone around you, uh, shake a hand, and welcome you here in the peace and love of Jesus Christ. Let no one go unwelcomed. Make sure they all get welcomed. may be seated. We're going to be blessed in our anthem this morning by our student choir. That's our uh, high school, junior high and high school kids, uh, led by Joseph, who's doing a great job with them. I think they're going to be singing in some German this morning, so get your translations out. It's going to be a, a blessing for you this morning.
Uh, let us uh, let's pray together. This morning, Lord, we're thankful for the sounds of trumpets and the voices of young people who proclaim in all languages of your love and grace and hope for us. Lord, this uh, day we thank you for our mothers who have given us life and love. May we grow in reverence and respect for the sacrifice made on our behalf that we might become who we are in your grace. We also on this day, Lord, lift before you mothers who have known the grief of losing a child, of the deep sorrow. May you come and fill them with hope. And may family, friends, and church learn gracious presence and healing comfort through your grace. We pray for women uh, who do not have children, whether by choice or by challenge, that they would know of your great passionate love for them, your person, uh, your personal love for them, your uh, plan for their life, um, and their value, Lord. We pray for you, uh, Lord, to come and be the source of strength to all of us, for all those who have nurtured us, whatever their names, whatever our relationship with them, for the wounds that have come in relationships that ought to have been ones of blessing and grace, but instead were burden and pain. May your healing hope fill and fuel, and may it call and claim us to lives worth living and love worth sharing. We thank you, Lord, for the story of hope that brings us together to sing these songs and read these scriptures. May we leave this place with that song in our heart and that story in our steps as we serve and bring blessing to the community to which you have sent us. And may the dirt itself be covered with your grace. The great prayer that we say together would come true, that your will, in fact, on earth would come true as it already is in heaven. So we pray together that prayer being reminded of Jesus' call to this missional prayer together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain seated and join the singing of our hymn of preparation, Fairest Lord Jesus.
On the front of your bulletin, you'll see Mary Sue and Leo. They're the Adams. Uh, it has a quote there about an orphanage. That's because Leo spent a chunk of his childhood, 10 years or so, uh, growing up in one. And so when he heard the talk of the challenges that foster care kids were facing in the present hour and the church's involvement in that, made a meeting here at the church and said, I'd like to do something. Because he saw a news report that said uh, in the many moves that happen uh, when a foster uh, child is moved from different places, they often have nothing to put their meager belongings in, uh, and so they put them in a trash bag. And Leo thought, we can do better than that. He said, so we partnered with a, uh, an area group that's helping to provide bags uh, for those kids so they can carry their items in a duffel bag. Uh, and so he is uh, sparked here, a little ministry here at university. There's a table that waits for those who want to see it out the back of the sanctuary to the right where you can either uh, find information on what kind of bags to bring or provide funds to buy more bags. Um, what I love about the story, it's beautiful, and hearing Mary Sue and Leo be uh, interviewed, you should go online and read the rest of their story. It, it's a story of an individual who took the challenges of their own life and turned them into blessing in the lives of others. This is the transformation that God calls us to. And it's a people who decided they wanted to do something and said, if anybody wants to help us, let's do it, and knew that they were called and created to be on mission for the kingdom. It's a beautiful story of what happens when God's people are God's people. The ushers are going to come forward. I invite you to remember the atoms as you give. This is what you make possible. The space and the purpose that God might get a hold of our hearts, put to work our hands, and get our feet chasing after him. So we invite you to give with boldness and courage, uh, knowing that God takes what we can offer, breaks and blesses, and sends it in the world, that we might be transformed and so too might the good news be known in our community. Let's pray. Lord, bless both gift and giver that both would grow in your grace. For any anxiety in this hour and moment around resources, would your peace come? Would we be freed from all the pressures uh, that this culture so binds us in around our finances and instead become people freed to be generous and filled with joy? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Please be seated. So I was uh, out last Sunday and missed Bible study on Wednesday as uh, my parents have managed to stay married for 50 years. And that's worth celebrating, yeah. I'll tell them you clap for them because I didn't make it easier. Uh, you're not clapping for me. Um, uh, 50 years of being married, so we were celebrating that, uh, got together, um, and astoundingly they agreed. My little sister and I uh, talked to them about let's do something special. They, they wanted to, in fine East Texas fashion, have lunch at, I mean, dinner at 4.30 and then go home. Um, and so we talked him into doing a little adventure, and, and for the first time since the government sent my dad on a plane five decades ago to Southeast Asia, he flew across an ocean, uh, and we went to France uh, for a week, and it was an amazing time together. The, the six of us, my wife and I, my little sister, and I don't think 12-year-old should be married, but she has a husband. <laughs> she claims to be 35, but I don't believe her. Um, and uh, my parents, and so without our kids, just us together, and it was, uh, it was a great uh, and wonderful adventure. I had a chance to visit the, the Normandy beaches uh, of World War II, the Verdun battlefields of World War I. Uh, I'll have some thoughts on those places in two weeks when we're on Memorial Day. They seem appropriate, having been in those places. Uh, and had some cultural exchange. I spoke a lot of Spanish to French people. Who... <laughs> were decent enough to uh, help me through. Uh, and it's easy to misunderstand and try to find your way. And I, I'm reflecting on the, on the experience, both because, you know, I get to visit these ancient churches, which, of course, because I'm a, what I do, I just love it. Um, and it's interesting on today that the, the church often, we don't do it as much anymore, but the church for uh, many, many centuries was talked about like a mother. The church was a mother. And these churches, these ancient cathedrals, are built like fortresses, strong but beautiful where the light comes in and with huge doors to let all who could want to come in come in and to send out into the world this good news of hope. I think that kind of fits the best of what we might believe about what it means to be a mother. And reflecting on the time we got to be together, I, I really, I started to think, you know, I used to live with these people my sister and my parents. I had an older sister who is since deceased, um, so I was the middle boy between two girls, which may explain a lot about me. It explains why I know the Girl Scout Pledge and not the Boy Scout Pledge. Uh, and, uh, and so I grew up, that was our home. And I, I remember thinking, as you grow up, you, you wanna do that. You wanna grow up, and then, then you wanna get out. Right? You want, you want to leave. I mean, that was like, especially as you get, the closer you get to leaving, the more you think, I'm going off into the real world. You know the real world, where your parents pay the rent and your only job is to go to class for two hours. <laughs> Didn't turn out quite as real as I'd hoped. Uh, but I wanted to get out. Like, I, and I, I, I wanted to, I, and I thought, given how hard it is now for us to be together, and I don't mean it's hard because, you know, the relationships are hard, although every relationship has challenges. I mean, it just, we live in different cities, and there's all the, the other humans we're responsible for now, and you know how it is. Maybe some of y'all are visiting family now. It just, it's few and far between. For a couple decades, or nearly so, we were together every day. We ate several meals a day together, most of the time. And here we were gathered on a table, uh, eating together, and I was thinking how amazing this is to get a chance to sit and talk. And, and just eat and be together. What a blessing family can be. And I know it can be birding too, but what a blessing it can be. And it made me just convicted of how much I had wanted to fast forward to the moments where that was my daily life. Because I thought there was something better somewhere else. And then it reminded me of about a month ago, I had lunch with a guy from the church whose kids are about to graduate. In fact, that's happening this month for people, college and high school graduations all happening. I saw some kids yesterday dressed up for prom, felt really, really old. Uh, Holly and I went to prom together, but it's been 20-something years, and that seems like a really big number. I know none of you are sympathetic about my aging process, but it's something I'm going through, okay? <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> I derailed my own self. What was I talking about? And so that, that we had that time together all the time back then, and now... Uh, now it takes such an effort to be together in those places. And then this gentleman was talking about how his kids are about to graduate. 
And I was talking to him, he's like, what's your kid's life? I was like, well, you know, we have, we have a one-year-old, we have a nearly four-year-old, we have a seven-year-old, we have a 10-year-old. And so I'm tired. <laughs> and he laughed and he said, you know, like, I remember that. He goes, but I'm now a couple weeks away from the last one moving out of my house. And they may come back and visit, they may come back and uh, stay a bit, but it'll never be the same again. And I realized that I'm tempted today to do the same thing I did when I was a kid. It's just, you know, you think you grow and you think you're mature, you think you're in a new place, and then you realize I too want to fast forward through certain moments, you know, like diapers. <laughs> We've been in diapers for a decade. I'm not asking for you to have sympathy, I'm just telling you my life. I look forward to sleep being up to me. That may sound odd to you, but I don't get to decide when I sleep. I look forward to playing golf again. I hear it's, people are still playing. And so sometimes in my mind, I get the same sort of inclination to be drawn towards believing. I just need to survive through these moments and then get to the good stuff. Our scriptures have been guiding us through uh, seasons with the Holy Spirit and characters of the Holy Spirit from Job who's on the ash heap of his life. And the Spirit there is in him in his breath. As long as I have the Spirit breath, I will tell the truth and I will praise the Lord. We looked at folks like Daniel who with discipline had a life shaped by the Spirit being in Daniel. We looked at Simeon whose patience uh, had him holding the, the birth of the Savior in his hands and his eyes have seen now the promise of the Lord fulfilled and all those decades of prayer made him ready for the moment when the Spirit revealed to him the truth. We looked at Joel and the pouring out of the Spirit on all flesh that God has a mission for the world and it requires every bit of flesh that will receive that Holy Spirit to be about that message, dreaming dreams and having vision. And last week you heard about Chloe and community and how that mission is fulfilled by individuals with gifts knitted together in a body. This morning we turn to the very beginning of Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 1, uh, to Jesus. Mark's gospel is the um, rapid, fast-fire, accelerated version of the gospel. Uh, Matthew is uh, long, has Jesus uh, doing law giving. Luke has lots of different stories he wants to make sure we know. John has Jesus talking, giving speeches. Mark is quick. It's always movement. Everything's immediate. It begins not with birth narratives, not, not with Mary and Joseph, uh, not with genealogies, but with John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptizer, uh, who is uh, described in his clothing. It's not normal. His food is kind of strange. John's not the guy you hope is your neighbor. Like you, if you live in an apartment, you don't want John above you. There's no telling what kind of sounds you're going to hear. John's an interesting guy. He has challenged the status quo and steps out of it. So he's out in the Jordan telling people to turn from the pathway that leads to death. And he's washing people in a river because the way that people are getting washed in the city isn't cleaning them. Because it's only immersing them in the broken, dirty system itself. And so John the baptizer is parallel with Isaiah's promise that a voice will cry out in the wilderness and say, repent, the kingdom of God is coming near. And so he says, there's somebody coming after me. And then our verse for this morning is, is verse 9. In those days, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So Jesus aligns himself with this sort of, the way things are isn't working to get clean that which has gotten dirty in this world. In verse 10, and just immediately, that's Mark's favorite word, as he's coming out of the water, Jesus sees heaven torn apart, that is the veil between heaven and earth that overlap is, is peeled open, and Jesus sees this vision uh, of the Spirit descending like a dove on him. If you know about doves, uh, think of a pigeon, but prettier, if you haven't been in the country lately. Um, and doves are gentle, they're not real aggressive, um, they descend slowly, they don't crash. So here's an image of the Spirit coming down softly onto Jesus, descending like a dove, and then a voice speaks. This voice from heaven says, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. My favorite scenes in the Bible. We saw this in a uh, Bible study a few weeks ago where this is what I call the Olin Mills moment of the Trinity. A couple giggles means that some of you raised kids in the 80s. That's great. Uh, 
Olin Mills, it may still be around, they're great, I think they still do directory for churches, but what Olin Mills meant for my family was, for some reason we all got put in, in sailor-styled clothing. My dad was in the military, but not the Navy, so I don't know why. We were navaled up, that's what we did, you know, ascots, it was just fantastic. So it was a very French Navy, and <laughs> then you all got together and you took a picture, right? Everybody was there, and it was like, you had some kind of like, fuzzy background, green screen type situation, except it wasn't electronic, it was, you know, it was a pull down thing. Uh, and that's what we, you know, every year you had to have one, really, as you go up the stairs in my parents' house, you could see us getting older and in larger naval suits. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what's happening there. It was the family together, and you're kind of marking the passage of time, and everybody wants to get together, and you keep mom happy, so you smile. Uh, and this is that picture. The sun is in the water, he comes out, the spirit like a dove descends, and the Father speaks. This trinity is kind of hard to get our minds around, and the idea that there's relationship within unity is something that challenges the very nature of our language. And yet here it is. God is one, and God has community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here really is our clearest image of an interaction directly between the three at Jesus' baptism the marking of him as the beloved son with whom I am well pleased. I told you this is the beginning of Mark's gospel. Nothing's really happened yet. In fact, Jesus hasn't spoken, hasn't fed 5,000, hasn't made the lame to walk, the blind to see, hasn't proclaimed great truths of the kingdom of God, has done none of that. And yet we have this declaration, you are my son, the beloved with you whom I am well pleased. Just pivotal bedrock truth for us here. If we think the things we do, if we think the relationships we build, if we think the achievements we have at work, if we think our success or our trophies define us as making us valuable or belonging or beloved, we will be frustrated, sad, and angry. Before Jesus does a thing, he's declared beloved. He belongs. He's the son of the one who sent him. As for Jesus, so for us. We must begin the adventure of being God's people, receiving unearned the declaration, you are my beloved, you are my child, and with you I am pleased. If you think God is only pleased with other people, with holy people or with those other folks that might do great uh, things and achieve wonderful things, we've bought into the lie that somehow the things we do define our lovability. God says, no, because you're mine, because you are, you belong in our beloved. We must begin there. And the gentleness of the scene is beautiful. The, the water, you can hear it running by. Here comes the dove like a spirit gently on Jesus. The voice speaks this deep truth about who Jesus is. And then, shockingly, everything changes. Verse 12. And the Spirit immediately, there's the favorite word, drove him out into the wilderness. The, the verb there, drove, is the same that we would see when Jesus drives demons out of people. Right? This is a, an aggressive driving. Drives Jesus into the wilderness. Drives them like uh, we might get driven into a real challenge. The wilderness, by the way, is not a, not a safe place. When I read Wilderness growing up, uh, and really even into a adulthood, whatever that, that means, uh, I would read this and think of Wilderness of my childhood. And Wilderness of my childhood was pine forest. It, it was big pine trees and pine needles and, and running around, finding creeks and uh, fishing. That was the wilderness. The Judean wilderness is a moonscape. It's flint rock. It, it looks like the beginning of Star Wars where they find Luke on the farm. That reference is not going to work for everybody, but if that is the image you have in your head, you've got it. Uh, it they they ha even have Bedouins out there. It's a, it's a desolate land. It is a hard land. And this is where the Spirit drives Jesus immediately after this declaration, driven to the wilderness. I don't want to be driven to the wilderness, do you? I, I want to be driven to the first-class lounge. I wasn't, but that's where I wanted to be driven to. Now, I want to be driven to the, the sunny day where the weather's great and, and things are lush. I want to be driven to the success and triumphs that I believe God might offer to me. 
That's where I want to be driven. Jesus, when he finds out, when he is declared to who he is and the spirit descends on him, is driven out into a barren place immediately. And he was in that wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Here ends the reading, the word of God for the people of God. So Jesus plunged in the water, comes out, beautiful, peaceful, by the stream moment. And then immediately driven into a place of confrontation and barrenness. It's a shock. But the Spirit is both the declarer of identity, of peace, and of comfort, and also the one that drives Jesus towards the challenge, towards the temptation that will come with the enemy's presence. Mark doesn't tell us much about that temptation. We get more in other Gospels about how that temptation went. It's about identity, right? Jesus has just been declared something and someone publicly, the Messiah, the hope of the world, and the enemy comes and says, well, if you are who you think you are, do this. If you really are who you think you are, then do this. Right? It's a challenge of identity and how that will be proven. But Jesus started where we ought to start. The identity wasn't proven, it was. The spirit like a dove had come, the voice of the Father had declared, but the wilderness still awaited. You know the wilderness moments of life. If you spend any time with the spirit, eventually you're there. What we need to learn today, I believe, is that we're in those moments that are challenging, hard, and barren. They are not proof of God's absence. Jesus was in the wilderness not because God didn't love him, not because God's beloved is always going to have uh, everything that God's beloved always wants, but in fact, God's spirit drove him into the wilderness. In those hard times, in those challenging moments, when we're pushed to our limits, we need to know that God is in fact with us. The angels attended to him, which means in the barren place, God was there. In the wild place, the agents of heaven were at work. Temptation comes from the enemy who says in this place, show me your weakness uh, and I will take advantage. I will exploit that. But Jesus is sustained by the same spirit that gave him comfort and call. It gave him provision and power. That's the Holy Spirit in Jesus. It's provision for the barren and wild places of our lives. It is power for the battles we must face. For the mission of Jesus is opposed. That's a shock to us today. There is opposition to hope, joy, love, and peace in the world. I, I don't know that I have to make that case real strong because I think you guys have access to most of the news stations or the internet. There are opponents of grace and goodness. There are temptations abounding. There are wild places. And God doesn't abandon them. He walks right into them and says sometimes to us by the power of the Spirit, you go too. Driven to those places where the burdens of our lives are diapers, or noise, or exhaustion, physical challenges, frustrations at work, stirrings of soul we don't understand. There are the wild and dark nights of our lives. Sometimes we're in those places the Spirit's driven us there because, and, and sometimes I don't want this to be true, but it is, there are things we learn in the wilderness and in the valley of the shadow that we don't learn beside quiet streams. We don't learn the extent of God's faithfulness. We don't learn actually our capacity and our calling to meet the challenges of our life until we're pushed. This is what the best coaches you've had knew. If they couldn't push you just a little bit harder to grow in your capacity to perform, then you wouldn't be all that you could be. This is what the best teachers among us know. We need to be challenged to find the full capacity of our grace. We need to fail. And here's the great thing about being gospel people. We can fail, but we can't lose. We can fail and fall short, but the spirit that drives us picks us up and sets our feet alight and back on the path following the one in whom we have our hope. The spirit of the living God poured out, declared something about Jesus, declared something about us, and this is why they go together, the comfort and the challenge. 
For in the barren and wild places, perhaps if it's your story today, if motherhood has been denied to you for whatever reason in the ache of your heart, I have walked that journey with people. Our blessing and prayers are with you. In those places, we need to know that we're beloved, that we belong, and with us, God is pleased. If your mother wasn't the person that, uh, you know, Hallmark thinks all our mothers were, if your mother wasn't there or was there toxically, uh, then maybe you need to know today that you belong and you're beloved and you're home among the people of God. Maybe like Leo, you grew up in an orphanage among people who loved you even though they weren't biologically related to you and made you believe that you could grow and be something. We're thankful for that because the wilderness of those moments can become blessing in the journey for you and for others. This is the challenge and the call to God's people as the church to be a fortress of hope, to be beautiful where the light pours in, to open wide the doors that all who would hunger and thirst for hope might find us among us because the wilderness is out there. The barren landscape of desperation, frustration, anxiety, boredom, and cynicism eat away at the hearts of those we live with, live around, and maybe even ourselves. And it is the spirit of comfort that says, you're still beloved, you're still mine, you are my child. And it's the agents of heaven that attend to those who find themselves in the wilderness. Because Jesus comes out of the wilderness with the enemy denied and says, repent. The kingdom of God has come near. That is the hope of heavens reclaiming this territory. The reason we must go through the wilderness is because God says this world is his. Creation will not be left to its state. Its creatures, his children, won't be left to the devices and designs and desires of the enemy. Instead, the invasion is on, Jesus says, and through the wilderness I will go, even unto death, to bring back that which belongs to God. This passion and this purpose is a part of Jesus' calling, and all the baptized share it. All those who have been washed have been called to the mission, whether that's to help people have a bag to carry their items between their moves, whatever it is you have been uniquely called and created for to be a part of in this mission. Repent, he says. Stop going that way. Let's go this way where hope, justice, beauty, love, and truth reign and win. And as soon as he declares that, he starts calling the first followers to join him. And the next scene, enemies of hope show up again. And Jesus drives them out because he has been driven by the Spirit on this mission. Brothers and sisters in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have this same purpose, this same passion. The good news to which we have been stewards that's been poured into our hands, poured into our hearts, that has cleansed us and calls us, sends us into a world to say, we've been driven and compelled here by the Spirit to be good news in a, de a desolate and broken and wild land. And enemies will tempt, will challenge and oppose, and there'll be hard times and it will hurt. But we can't lose. For Jesus has already won the great victory for us on the cross and in the resurrection and calls us forward in that hope as a resurrection people to declare to a world that has gone wrong in so many ways those folks that bring violence and pain to a world whether it's in a church in Indonesia where they gathered for worship just like we did and a bomb explodes killing children, women, men or the streets of Paris uh, with another attack, a street that I was just on. Those folks who seek to claim with their violence control over the earth, our hearts and our fears, we say we've been driven here by the Spirit. We are not afraid. We will not fear those who are set against hope. We will not fear our own uh, shortcomings. We will not fear the wilderness itself, for we have been compelled and sent and driven, in fact be people of the Spirit in this place, on purpose for this moment. It's a reason to get up in the morning and to give our lives and our hopes and our hearts to the cause of Christ in our midst. The Spirit makes possible in His purpose and power and His wisdom. We, amazing, stunning even since we know each other, 
the beloved, the ones who belong, the ones who are God's children, you, me, all who have ears to hear and eyes to see, are called to this family, called to this purpose. And we'll be tempted from time to time when we face challenges or hard moments in the life of a congregation, life of a family or an individual, to want to fast forward and get to something better. The amazing truth is that when the Spirit of God drives us into places, sometimes it's the time of burden that's the best stuff we'll ever have. Sometimes it's in our highest moment of challenge that the true nature of our character gets revealed, and so we have the celebration of becoming these people that we were called to be. Sometimes the stuff we want to fast forward through is the stuff later we'll look back and say, that was the moment when I came to know. Those were the precious gifts of grace in my life. This is the family I was built to gather around and with. Let us eat and not accelerate for this moment and this time is ours that God has given us to be stewards over in his spirit. Let us pray. Lord, we're often in a hurry to get to somewhere else, to something else, to someone else. And yet even in the hardest, in the toughest, in the broken places, you are there. So open us to the wisdom of the truth of this day, this day, these moments, the blessings and yes, the burdens, the comfort and yes, the challenge, and your spirit that sees us through it all, may we be driven by that same spirit to face the future unafraid, with courage and love defining us and sending us, with hands open to serve, feet fit to follow, and our eyes fixed upon your kingdom coming near, and we turn and repent and follow you as you call. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Several ways that you can respond to what God is up to in your life and in our community. Uh, the first of which is, uh, as we mentioned, there's a table out. Uh, if you go out the sanctuary doors and turn right, there in the corner will be those bags where you can help folks uh, in our foster care system know uh, they are not trash. We believe they are, in fact, treasures, that they're beloved and they belong both to God and to us. And if a bag can impart that uh, beautiful message, then it's worth figuring out how to do that. So we're going to be a part of that. Uh, Wednesday, we'll have that table out again, and next week as well. Uh, next Sunday is a special Sunday. Uh, in a number of ways, it's Pentecost Sunday. Uh, that's May the 20th. So we've been doing the Spirit series. It culminates on May the 20th with the Spirit poured out in a new way upon followers of Jesus, Pentecost Sunday. It's also our... Um, it's our tech-savvy Sunday here at university. So if you've ever thought, you know, I have trouble navigating the website or the mobile web or the, uh, our app, if you want to know how to do live stream, which is how you watch, folks are watching right now on your computer or on your phone, we're going to have folks set up as you leave worship uh, to help guide you in that process. If you want to set up an account where you can sign up for Bible studies or for mission trips or uh, to, to donate to different causes at the church or to give online, reoccurring or otherwise. We're going to have folks help you set that up next week uh, and guide you through that. In a few weeks, we'll do it on the south side. So that'll be a, uh, I'm sorry, on the north side. On the south side, we'll have that next week. And then in June, we'll do it uh, on the north. We believe there's some real help to the congregation that's available through the technology. We want to make sure everybody can use it uh, as they so desire. It's also uh, a special day for me. Uh, my first senior pastor I work for, a mentor, friend, brother in Christ, Chap Temple, will be here uh, because we are 75% we are baptized for our children. We have four of them, and so uh, Judah's left to do, and he's done the other three, so we thought, why not make it a clean sweep for him? The others seem, the baptism seems to be taking, so we're going to let him do that. So he'll be here next week, and uh, I'm excited about that. It'll be a special time uh, as, his, as he'll be a part of our worship, all the services uh, with us here, and we're excited about doing that. Uh, today, because we celebrate uh, mom, those who have moms and women uh, in our lives, the coffee and the breakfast tacos uh, are free uh, for anyone who either is a mother or who had a mother, who, who knows a mother. Um, we just wanted to make it a special day. I know some of you have been uh, compelled to come to church by your mother. You get a breakfast taco because we love you, you belong, and you're beloved. Uh, if you want to join with this family, that's what we are. 
You commit yourself to the cause of Christ and to us. We accept you as one of God's uh, broken but blessed and beloved children. Uh, we'd love to say yes to you as well. Uh, so I stand down here, and uh, if you want to do that today, we'd love to meet with you uh, and have you make a confession that Jesus is your Savior, that this is your church, and then the church will commit to you in the same way, and you'll be home. Uh, as we sing a great hymn of our faith, Because He Lives, it's hymn 364. Would you stand now as we sing? Life is indeed worth the living even in the wilderness. You are driven from this place by the power of the Holy Spirit to be agents of hope, sharers of peace, declarers of love in a world barren of all that and then some. May you go under the banner and courage for the invasion is underway and the victory is secure under the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.